Join Chris and Suzanne Vester today on Faith Family Fulfillment as they lead discussions on creating a strong bond and having a loving relationship through Christian values. Guests on the show share insightful stories and ideas to enhance a positive family upbringing and create trust in one another, as well as providing encouraging words of wisdom everyone should hear. And now, here are Chris and Suzanne. Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of Faith Family Fulfillment. I am your co-host, Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And um, we're going to talk about conflict today. Why have it? What's the positives? Are there really negatives to conflict? Kind of an interesting topic, I think. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. I'll pray soon we'll get started. Lord, thank you for this opportunity for us to come together today and have some discussion about things that probably may ring a bell for most people about the positives and the negatives that come from conflict and how, when we keep you at the center of everything, it kind of eases out the conflict and the good results can come, which means coming into alignment. We ask you to lead and guide us in this conversation and keep us in your service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So this subject came about because a friend of mine um, posted up something on Instagram yesterday. It was a quote by Ray Dalio. Um, and just in case you're not aware of Ray Dalio or who he is, um, he's a hedge fund manager. He started Bridgewater. Um, he was founded to Bridgewater um, in the 1970s. Um, billions of dollars in net worth, but where a lot of people know him from is his book called Principles. Of life and work, which really dives deep into culture principles. It came from conversations he had with people in the organization about where he was succeeding and failing. You know, it led him to write this book about culture more than anything. I'd say culture. Um, and the quote was from Ray Dalio: "It's the principle of the day: recognize that conflicts are essential for great relationships because they are how people determine whether their principles are aligned." and resolve their differences. So there's two hows there, how they determine what the principles are aligned and it's how they resolve differences. So I kind of want to unpack what that means. So I think when people hear the word conflict, the, the immediate feeling about conflict is a negative. The word conflict brings about negative imagery. So how do you like what's a better word is there a better word for conflict or did we just keep it that simple because i think when people think about conflict they immediately go into argument right there but there are different kinds of conflicts i mean there are things that aggravate you there are things that make you angry there's a spectrum there right so i don't know that you would want to change the word right okay so conflicts are essential which i happen to really agree with the statement it's the only way to determine if the people in your circle, right, align with you. Because his book is written, it's his life and work. Um, his was really written about work culture in this case, maybe. But the people that are around you in your circle, do they align with you? Do you have a alignment in your principles? And if you do, are there still differences? Where do the differences come from? And the only way to resolve those is by getting them out on the open and on the table. The gentleman that shared this with me, I, you know, Jay, shout out to Jay. He shared it on Instagram. He and I actually had a conversation about the importance of conflict the last time he was in town. And I said, you know, right now, culture itself, specifically, I think American culture more so than others, but let's talk about the American culture right now. There is this hesitancy to speak out um, because either one, either number one, you're going to hurt somebody's feelings or number two, you're going to be ostracized and kicked out of society as a whole because culture as a whole doesn't want their feelings hurt and sometimes the best thing you can do is i mean not hurt somebody's feelings but point out inconsistencies point out issues point out incongruencies um, point out misalignments um, so that you can discuss them you know i don't want to use the word cancel culture which you know that right now if you have a narrative that doesn't agree with the collective narrative and or while, the perceived collective yeah, narrative. perceived yeah that's a good word perceived collective narrative then you're ostracized from everything that's just like you disappear you know mm -hmm. so the idea is because i i don't want to hear what you have to say you no longer exist so the unwillingness to have conflict 
Like it's, there's a, it's too uncomfortable. I don't want to be a part of that. And you see what's happening right now in our culture is this a, it's a dissolving of values. There's no collective set of values. I mean, we were a country founded on a set of values. Um, there's a really good book written by Benjamin Franklin Morris. It's about 900 pages, um, three pages in it. <laughs> but the, the idea of this book is it deep dives into our country's founding and the principles that our country was founded on, this value system that our country was founded on. And, you know, we are so misaligned with that right now. Um, and it gets worse the further away we get from the ability to have conflict or even just to say simple discussion. Yeah. Maybe friction would be a better word because um, yeah. there has to be a little bit of a rub in order for anything to get polished. Right. So if you want to, to get better or you want to have something that is greater than what you're currently doing or sitting in, you're going to have to get uncomfortable and friction creates discomfort but you have to be okay doing that. And I think if more people were willing to put aside preconceived notions, put aside what they think they know and talk about things in a, an open arena, I think they would find that they're far more alike than they are different. Oh, for sure. For sure. You know, and I dipped into just the culture, culture at large. Um, but it, you know, this is a podcast about faith, family fulfillment. When it comes to family, like starting off with immediate family, like wife, husband, children, and the ability to have conflict there. Because I think divorce comes from unresolved conflict, unapproached conflict, or untapped conflict. Isn't that what the irreconcilable difference is? That's what they say. <laughs> it's an irreconcilable difference. Well, how many of those differences started out prior to the marriage even coming to fruition? Because if we're unwilling to have deep dive conversations to recognize where there's an alignment of principles or even prior to marriage, resolving the differences, you know, I think that's the whole idea of premarital counseling, but the idea of, Hey, let's come together with a third party and figure out, Hey, do we even align um, with where we're trying to go and what we see? If that practice takes place, then is that the baseline to, Hey, we can go back to that and say, we, like we said, we aligned with this. Where did it go sideways? And I'll say for us, well, I'll say for me, I can only speak for me. We have not always been great at resolving conflict. Yeah. I wouldn't call us great now. I think we just have less of it at this point. Maybe a little bit. So, so how do we have, so, okay, that's, let's unpack that for a minute. Do we have less of it because we don't want to have it and we're unwilling to have it because we don't want to hurt each other's feelings? Or do we have less of it because we are more aligned in our principles now than we were? Or have we resolved the differences? Mm. I don't think we're afraid to hurt each other's feelings. I think that's fair to say that we are very not afraid to hurt each other's feelings. Right. Because of conflict, I think we've become more aligned in where we're going and what's going to happen and where that's going to be. So they're, if someone's listening and say, well, man, they're talking about how well they're, how good they are at conflict. That sounds like a horrible marriage. Like if there's like conflict, wasn't, isn't that ugly? Isn't that fighting? Like, what do you, like, how do you explain to someone who's listening when we're using the word conflict, how it's not about fighting? No, you can disagree. You can have different viewpoints and perspectives. Um, perfect example. I'm very risk averse. You are not. We are never going to align in that area, ever. <laughs> but your risk tolerance doesn't ever really put anyone in our family at, in any harm or danger of not having a roof over our head, or there's no malintent with your risk tolerance. I am sometimes not comfortable with it, but I know that you don't, that you do it not you don't do it because you want bad things to happen and i'm okay with with you taking jumps out of an airplane and building your parachute on the way down because that i know you so i think some of that has to come from understanding your partner's motivation or your child's motivation or parent or whatever and if they're not doing something to hurt you 
then sometimes I think you can have differences of opinion and it not be bad. I mean, you may say, hey, I want to go do something that is just completely outrageous in my mind. And I'm like, why? We may not agree on it, but that doesn't mean that we need to drive a divide over it. Right. So what I'm hearing you say is you understand more and more because of our conversations that, yes, I am very risk averse. No, I am risk averse. I'm not. I'm not risk averse. You're risk averse. But at least the risk I take, there is calculation with them. Am I hearing that? I think you you see the calculation. (laughs) Sometimes I'm just asking the questions. Gotcha. So you still don't think I'm a calculated risk? I think in your mind you do, but our brains are not alike in that, in that regard. Right. I like to have things laid out very sequentially and you're like, nah, like this is the end. This is where we're going. All that stuff in the middle. It's just details. We'll figure it out. The details matter to me. Yes. And details do matter. So like in our marriage, how how have we gotten to that point? And not just about risk, but other things. How have we gotten to the point? And maybe, you know, we, you and I use the terms not afraid to hurt each other's feelings, because I don't know of another way to describe that. It's, we're both okay, knowing that the other person's coming at us with, number one, raw feelings that are probably legitimate and or from a place of love, right? Yes. So if it's, like when you're coming at me about something that you feel like I am taking too big of a risk, your discussion with me, even though it may be like totally polar opposite of what I'm thinking, comes from a place of love for me. And when you are speaking on something that is something that I'm doing that doesn't, that conflicts with you, that just grates your nerves, it's because like this is a legitimate issue for me. So please stop. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. So how do we get there? And you can't just say 29 years. I was going to say 29 years of, yeah, of but, stepping in the ditch okay. and doing it wrong. Right. But is it wrong if we got to 29 years? I think it could have been wrong if we had just decided to stay in the ditch. So how do we, how did we get out of ditches? Continuing talking, continuing conversation. Right. Continuing conflict. Right. And sometimes it's not resolved. I mean, there are some things that we don't agree on. I think they're probably less of them now than they have been, but I mean, there are just some things that we don't, we don't necessarily go. Yeah. I'm a hundred percent on board with that. Shoe collections. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get to is if someone's listening and they're saying, well, why in the world would someone believe that conflicts are essential? Looking back at 29 years, we can say conflicts are essential. If there's not conflict and everything that you say is agreed, like if I were to say, whatever I say, you, yes, of course, absolutely. One of us is lying. One of us is not satisfied. One of us is not fulfilled. One of us is not happy. One of us is feeling like they're not being served well. Right. Agreed. So, well, I am being served well, but I did really agree with you. I don't want it to sound like I'm just yesing you. <laughs> but, you know, I'd say one of the things that I know I've been guilty of in the past is moving forward with my own agenda without consulting you first. Like it happened really, really quick in our marriage. First four months we're married. I leave the house one Sunday afternoon mm-hmm. and come home with a motorcycle. And oh, you're I've been, been married four months at that point. That was before Christmas. Yeah. So we're at three months, three and a half months, two and a half. Okay. Two and a half months. Two and a half. <laughs> so, and there was the response I got driving in the driveway was, I thought you were going to look and my response was, yeah, but I liked it. Yeah. (laughs) So conflict immediate and quick, 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 quick conflict. So, so if it started that early for us, right. Obviously I'm the one that needed to learn very quickly to communicate better. How did that not get us off the rails? Like that was quick and that was Mm -hmm. early and that was a big conflict. Not for me, because I just rolled over like a speed bump. <laughs> but but for you, that was a big, big conflict. I mean, it even caused, and I'll say this in all fairness, it caused conflict with their parents. They were not happy with me because I had made their daughter unhappy inside of the first quarter of the <laughs> first two months of our marriage. Yes. Right? Right. And that's fair. Like it's 100% fair. And just in case my mom and papa are well, happily, happily listening. Yeah. But this requires a little bit of context. Because out of context, it sounds really awful. And it was very frustrating. I will not deny. But we got married Mm mid-September. This was 
before Christmas, so first part of December. December it was cold outside. December, but, yes. It was um, December 7th, 10th, something like it was yeah. early December. We had relocated. We had lived with your parents for a couple of weeks while the house we were moving into was being finished and getting the CO. We moved in what mid October, first part of October. Yeah, in mid October. Um, so, you know, we had relocated. I was not working at the time. I was um, back in school. I had finished college, had done a year of graduate work, and jobs were just not really available, I guess would be a fair statement for what I did at the time. And so I was back in school. So it was move, life change, career change, back to student, you know, things were sparse, I think would be a fair estimation. Um, And I was like, here we are in this huge transitional season of our life. Things have been completely kind of like thrown up in the air and we're just waiting for the rest of them to continue to fall because we had really, um, I mean, things were not very like solid in terms of like where we're going to be in the next year. What's going to be going on? Where are you going to be working? What are you going to be doing? What am I going to be doing? And then that was a very big financial decision made with, Hey honey, I'm home. (laughs) Yeah, it was, um, I think disappointing would be the right, the right way to phrase it. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm your wife now. I know that, I know that, you know, you've been making big boy decisions for a really long time, but now it's not just you that you're making that decision for. You're kind of throwing us both into that decision and there was no discussion. True. I wouldn't have said no. Oh, and it's weird. I, know, like I, I think that's. Oddly enough, we had we had been together for three years at that point, and I think that's part of what I knew. Like I know I knew. Let me rephrase that. I felt like that if I had the conversation, the answer would have been go. Yeah. You know, but I think it speaks to you said well, I go my risk averse. Mm-hmm. Like that all felt like a warm bubble bath to me. Like it was <laughs> like not knowing what was happening, not knowing where we were going. Not, I mean, like we knew like my job. Like I loved my job. I enjoyed what I was doing. But there was a lot, like, am I going to be in Clinton a lot? Am I going to be in Wilson? There was a lot up in the air with, like, what the daily drive was going to look like. But, like, what I would be doing, I felt solid in. But, yeah, it was a, it's funny when you go back and you look at it in, you know, 26 years backwards. Like, I can't re- ever remember feeling like, oh, my gosh. And you had to be feeling like, oh, my gosh. Mm. Right? <laughs> and I'm just like, man, you're just swimming in it. Let's just play. Hey, it's going to happen. It's going to be okay. Not in an ugly way. I just never felt like unstable with even with all that going on. But it was a major, major conflict. And we ended up talking it out. I think it was actually after your parents came to visit. And I recognized, man, every the whole family's upset with me. Wow, this is a big <laughs> deal that we had a conversation about it. And I think that's probably the last time that happened. I don't remember it happening any not since then. Mm-hmm. But I think that leads to the, like we talked about before we got on having this conversation for that to work correctly, you've got to be willing to number one, hear the conflict and be willing to participate in it. Mm-hmm. In other words, not if you're the one that let's say, let's say somebody's wronged you. If, if someone has wronged you or you're the one that's been wronged, your ability to handle the conversation, you know, and not be offended. You know, right now the world is, hey, I can't offend anybody. Like everybody's got an equal voice, which they do. But the whole idea of everybody having their own truth is re- is just ridiculous. Like there is only and, one truth. Well, true. And I think you have to understand that being offended is a choice. Correct. You can choose very, very clearly choose whether or not you allow someone's words to affect you and how much power you're going to allow those words to have over you and in your life. Right. Right. Agreed. And so knowing that's the case in the culture we're seeing right now to inability to choose the right path, it's an immediate, like I'm going to get immediately offended by the mm-hmm. simplest of things because it doesn't align with my principles or my set of, or let's, let's use the word if everybody's using my, it doesn't align with my truth. So if, if that's the case, then how to, how do you get to the point 
I mean, in, in marriage, like, I think it's easier because I, I do believe that you go into it with a, with a common set of at least base principles, mm-hmm. you know, something brought you together, something brought you to the point that you want to be hitched for life, hopefully that you're like, you start off with that in mind, mm-hmm. but how do you get to the point of being able to have those conversations and the conflicts without the fear of offending, right? So it's it, not to be driven by fear or the attitude of, Hey, it, they're coming at me in love. So I don't need to be offended. I need to listen. I think you have to have some ground rules of how you're going to handle conflict weaponizing actions, weaponizing words, making someone feel shamed over something is never okay. Um, Because at that point, you're attacking the person in their personhood versus what you are taking offense from. So if there is an action that needs to be addressed, then address that action. But don't make it personal so that you're conveying your opinion and your thoughts of that action onto the person. So you're not making that person feel um, that that's who they are and how you see them. And that's how you are um, identifying them. There, People do things that they would really like to take back all the time. And once it's done, you can't, but you, you cannot, you can't take whatever it was that happened or was said And then that become that person. And that's how you see that person, because that's, that's not fighting fairly. That's not having conflict. That's going to end up making you better. And resolve the difference. Right. You're just going to end up continuing to um, make it more and more venomous. And then you're, you're going to end up, you know, hurling things at each other that are going to be very harmful and hurtful and cut deep and probably won't be forgotten. Maybe even to the point where, because it is so personal and so deep, there's no resolution there. So, you know what I love when we have these conversations, just the two of us, you know, this is, we're over 40 episodes deep. And when quotes by former guests pop in my head as we're going through things, because, you know, everybody we've, everybody we've had on here, long marriages, worked through a lot of conflicts, successful marriages. And two people just came to mind when, you know, Steve got some coaching once and he said one of the best things he learned and one of the quotes was you have to give up the right to be right. Yeah. Remember when he said that? Mm -hmm. And I think about Chad and Brooke, whose episodes gotten a lot of traction and the grace that he handled her Mm -hmm. addiction with, Mm -hmm. because he made the statement, like you just said, I didn't put the addiction on her as how that's how I saw her. Right. I didn't see her as the addiction. I saw the addiction for what it was, so it was easier to handle that situation with grace, mm. you know? So if I think if we take just those two quotes, like go into it and giving up the right to be right, which is really difficult for me. And the other side of that is not, you said it well, of, you know, having displaying enough grace that you're not taking that situation and identifying them as that. This is yes. who you are because of the dumb action you took. Mm-hmm. That's not who you are. You're better than that. Mm-hmm. So at least in previous experiences with you. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that served us well in handling conflict or even getting into conflict and bringing conflicts to the surface so we could talk about them is doing therapy. You know, like we have talked about it on here before, how much I feel like therapy served us because there is a third person in the room that's help, helping mediate or facilitate or um, referee referee for whatever reason, <laughs> the conflict itself, like it's mm-hmm. helping you work through it because I think when there is conflict in most cases, both people go into it thinking they're 100%, hundred percent right. Or that they're trying to seek validation, validation, justification. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think it's important too. And this happened not too long ago um, when we were in the kitchen with Avery and you were saying something and I was saying something, you weren't hearing it, how I was saying it. And I just kept saying but we're saying the same thing. You're like, no, you're not understanding me. And Avery, our, who is, if you don't know, our um, our oldest daughter, she was like, you're saying the same thing. Like y'all are literally saying the same thing, but you're just using different words. And I think a lot of times that's where conflict starts. For sure. It's just not having, um, not having the ability to hear what is being said 
in a way that is conveying what's being said. I know that was very circular in talking, but like you can say something and I'm hearing you, but when I repeat it back, I'm repeating it back with my voice and how my brain is processing it. And your brain isn't hearing it the same. So you assume, or I could assume you're not hearing me. I hear you loud and clear. That's just how I'm processing it. So I think it's important to understand that it doesn't have to be vocalized in the exact same speech in order for you to be on the same, like you're on the same level, you're in the same field, you're reading from the same book, whatever you want to use as your display of that. Sometimes you just need for that third person, whomever that might be, to step in and go, okay, time out. You're both saying the same thing. Now use language that you both understand. Right. <laughs> right. So thank goodness Avery was in the room. Yeah. Shout out to Avery. Thank you, man. So which um, by the way, she thought it was hilarious. Yes, she did. She thought it was hilarious. <laughs> like this is like this is crazy. She's like, and, how have you done this for so long? Yeah. Like, how like, well, is this how it normally happens? But you know, that that's a good thing to bring up too. Like, I think the worst thing you can do is like fight in front of your children. Mm-hmm. But I think if they're able to see you display grace and giving up the right to be right and i'm not saying that either one of those are displayed in that moment by either one of us but i'm saying if they can see you resolve conflict the picture that it paints for them is hey even when there's a disagreement it doesn't mean it's the end all like it's i think there's so many times that you know it's we're in a disposable society so the idea is hey if marriage doesn't work for me i can just like we can just dispose of it and go to the next one Mm -hmm. like what is it thank you next when there's a song called thank you next yeah but if they can see you resolve it in a way that that doesn't end in somebody throwing something at the other one like oh there is a healthy way to mm-hmm. work through emotions disagreements discussions and come to a resolution of differences mm-hmm. that's really what it resulted in mm-hmm. you know i wish i could remember what we were discussing now that's how important it was i can't even remember it a week later so but um i was listening to um a podcast from Life Church, Craig Rochelle. I'll try to link it in the in the show notes because it's worth listening to. They're doing a series on um, marriage. So it's called, I think it's called Save the Date. And the part that I had just gotten to before I got out of my car to come in and record this was, he said, you know, I think the problem with why we're so comfortable in not trying to work through things is because we've gotten to the habit of, well, we're not going to, do it God's way. We're not going to go into it as the covenant that it is. It's just a contract and contractual things are typically pieces of paper and they come out of distrust. So if you are, I'm going to use his example. If you are drawing up a contract with someone who's going to do repairs at your house, you're trying to limit your liability and responsibility while making sure the work gets done. And they're just trying to make sure that once the work is done, they get paid which doesn't really communicate that you believe the other one is actually going to go through with it unless you put it on paper. And he said, unfortunately, if you're looking at your marriage in that same way, then it's just a piece of paper. So why get married? Which leads to people living together prior to marriage. And then they you know, end up not just sharing space and sharing bills, but maybe sharing pets and then sharing kids and then sharing all these other things. And then something happens and they're no longer satisfied. So they just break up and move on. So when they do get into a marriage and conflict arises, their go-to, their default in their mind is, well, I'm just going to break up and move on. Not that I'm going to actually sit in it for a minute, figure out where this came from, because we all bring baggage. We all bring things that are unresolved. We just do. But instead of working through that, we're just going to break up and move on. And that just creates a perpetual cycle of people bringing more and more baggage right. into the next and into the next and into the next and until you resolve the conflict, the rub that created that first, well, I'm going to break up and you know, we'll divorce and whatever, and we'll move on. You're never going to get to that point. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Cause it's, um, I like that example too, because yeah, it is covenant. And it's one of the things that we discovered the first time we went to therapy. I said the first time, the first time we visited therapy, our first experience with therapy, was looking at marriage for what it is and and it is a covenant which is much much different i challenge everyone listening go google covenant covenant marriage right google it together right so any more takeaways any more conflict we need to resolve Mm. 
Not today. Okay. So thank you guys for listening. You want to pray yourself? Okay. Father God, thank you for allowing us some elbow to elbow time where we can sit and enjoy each other's company and share life experiences um, with the knowledge that someone is going to listen and hear what's being said. And it's really going to turn something on for them in, in their life that's going to make a big difference. We know that that's how you use our efforts um, as long as we keep you in the center. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to another episode of Faith, Family, Fulfillment, brought to you by Chris and Suzanne Vester. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guests and stories. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow Chris and Suzanne on Instagram at H-V-A-U-T-O-C-O-O and Suzanne.C.Vester. That's at S-U-Z-A-N-N-E dot C dot V-E-S-T-E-R.